every practice of Aum is an experience of oneself in relationship to all of reality. That's what it is. Because it's under the assumption that everything is sound or everything is sounding. Everything has sound. This is the famous case of John Cage going into the anechoic room where uh, a scientifically created structure to make absolutely no sound whatsoever come in. So you go into the anechoic um, room and what do you hear? You're supposed to hear nothing. He did and he was very disappointed and this is one of the starting point of his book called Silence. He couldn't find silence in the anechoic chamber. He heard a high pitched sound and he heard a kind of lower rumble. And when he came out the technician said well the high pitched sound it, you were hearing was your, your nervous system. And the low pitch sound was your organism functioning within itself. So you, that's the range from the high pitch to the low pitch was already going on. Aum was already happening inside the reality of sounding body. Just to be alive is to make sound. Supposedly atomic structure has sound within it. I haven't heard it, but they say that. Um, music of the spheres implies that there's music everywhere, and that these are the fundamental sounds. The bija, om is a bija. It's a bija mantra. It's the, the ultimate bija mantra, supposedly. And bija means seed from which all things grow. So the implication of the very view that om is important is a view that everything is sound. That's fundamental. Your body is sound. And when you're working with yoga, which could include everything from Tai Chi to all systems of discipline that are conscious, because yoga simply means bringing together, yoking, putting things together, things that are extreme or unlike each other or dissonant, and bringing them into a kind of harmony or resonance, to a resonance center. And all yoga systems are basically attempts to view the body and mind as one and through that medium of, of integration, the yoga, the integration, is the realization of their non-separateness. So, but it happens at the level of sound, of vibration, which vibration, sound is vibration, right? And so you are looking at your body from inside as resonant with itself. So if I make a move, how do I do that? From my point of view, it's, a, it's an expression of axiality which is that the center, once you get in touch with it, <clears throat> which Om would be, saying Om would be a practice of, for instance, getting more in tune, because it does tune you up to say Aum. It doesn't represent all reality as such, but it does tune you. Any mantra, any, any mantra, all mantras are the sons and daughters of Aum in that sense. They're all particular resonances that tune you in particular ways, and it can be used for healing. John Beaulieu uses tuning forks to heal people because there are certain tuning forks and certain tonalities that are particular to certain parts of the body and certain functions of the body and they work very well in doing that. You know, C128 causes nitric oxide to release in the body which is the basis of growth hormones. So you put it in your brain, your brain gives out more nitric oxide. If you put the 128C128 on your heart, it causes nitric oxide in your heart to be become productive. So pra the practice of Aum or any mantra is the bija or seed of the, of the healing and wholeness um, and furthering of that being on its own primordial terms. From its natural healing capability, its natural reality within itself is released by the, by the attunement that comes through saying, what, saying the sounds of Aum correctly or in such a way that they reson resonate with yourself. So the point of this is to, is to recognize that our engagement with these principles is a tuning, a tuning of ourselves to ourselves and a tuning of ourselves to each other. So for instance, we talk about communication. If all language has aum within it, or ah, the ah of the aum within all of the sounds, 
And the body is sound, and the body is resonant, resonant possibility. And things attract to each other, like attracts like. Or th you put a tuning fork in the room next to you, you will tune to it, because sounds do that. Things that are sound tend to move toward each other. They align, um, they entrain to each other. So you're using the principle of entrainment when you go aum. You're entraining, you're tuning to that sound. And it tunes all your cells right down to the, to the, to the atomic level. Now, communication between people is usually taken to be, I have something to say to you. But that, let's, say, let's say that what language does or what sound does is a continuum. At one end of it is communication. What I do that I want to give to you. So I'm informing you of something or I'm telling you how I feel or I'm something like that. The other end is communion. Communion is where they recognize each other, align with each other and become each other, become non-separate from each other. And we all have had these moments where we experience that with other people, where things are just, I, I really tune into that person kind of feeling. That's the principle of actual relationship between sounds. It's the principle of how things discover each other through their common basis. And that common basis is most primordially in sound, according to the view that produces a notion of aum. So aum is, our, is a technique. It's, a, it's, a, a, it's a, a, a kind of symbolization, a kind of uh, opportunity, a kind of sharing of a principle that allows us to engage that. On the notion of it sound being common to all things, I'm going to read you a very nice statement of that principle by John Beaulieu in his fantastic book called Human Tuning, in which he describes the method of using tuning forks to bring your system in. It, it's really doing what saying a mantra is supposed to do. Mantra saying is one technique for doing that, looked at from the point of view of sound. Another one is using tuning forks, and that can be more effective because people don't know how to make the sounds aum properly so that it tunes. It takes a lot of practice before your aum gets deep enough that you can actually touch the full range of sound through the act of making that sound. That's, that's, that takes practice, just like yoga takes practice for the same reason. And in this great book, um, Human Tuning, uh, sound healing with tuning forks. He starts out with a little statement that we are sound. Imagine that the whole universe, everything we know, including cars, computers, airplanes, houses, buildings, lakes, oceans, continents, our bones, flesh, and nerves, is a fountain of dream images generated and sustained by a submerged sound. Further, imagine that everything we do and think, whether good or bad, moral or immoral, is an attempt to seek out and merge with that sound. Our goal is to return to the source of the fountain. Although we may identify with the object of value, i.e. a man or a woman, a car, etc., the real attraction is the resonance we experience when in the presence of that person or thing. The experience vibrates us like a tuning fork and becomes a sonic homing buoy confirming our inner journey. Further, imagine that you are a being of sound composed of many tones. Your shape, movements, desires, and motivations come from an inner concert. Everything you know and feel is sound. Your concert is everywhere. When you dance, your body organs will make sounds and your muscles will play the correct tones. Your voice will sing praises and the stars will shine on you. So that's the basis of his saying that you can use certain tuning forks to bring yourself to that sound. The other way of doing it is to 
instead of rejecting your negative feelings and your negative emotions and, and um, whatever is disrupting and becoming dissonant for you, you relax into them and allow them to quiet down within themselves by not being opposed. When we oppose something, we strengthen it. So by aligning ourselves within it and accepting it and not trying to suppress it, we get down to the base of it where it now shows its original sounds and comes, relaxes down into its primordial originality. And when we get to that point, the dissonance disappears. So one end is we use the tuning fork or the ohm to strive toward perfection. The other end is we just get with what we are and allow ourselves to be what we are and get down to it and be with it, just relaxing instead of opposing, instead of being nervous. Because when your body's nervous, it's making certain sounds. And you can actually detect that with certain devices. And you can experience it too. I do body work and I can feel where I, my hand goes right to where the person is having a problem. I don't think about it. I don't even look. I just find it's there and I start, start to move with it. And the person, how do you know that's what I needed? Because I'm listening. And the basis of everything is listening. Meditation is listening. Yoga is listening. It's not doing yoga. It's not doing the right move. It's not looking the right way. And when you teach yoga or teach sound or teach any of these things as a perfective thing that you're not yet, it misleads the person. The person needs to know that if they relax into what they are, they will discover that. Okay, I need to know that this is a certain yoga move or whatever, or a certain Tai Chi move. But I need to find it by discovering how I can flow into that without resistance and without effort. Yoga is not yoga if it's not effortless. If you're making an effort, you're running against yourself. You're in your own way. You're tripping over your own feet. Same thing with, with Aum. By projecting its perfection, you'll never find it. By looking for the resonance with it, by hearing someone else perhaps who's really good at saying, at chanting Aum, you might try to entrain to that. You listen to that. But it's all about listening. You do what you hear. You, do, you say what you can hear. Your, your, your use of language is based on what you hear. You want to, quote, improve that. You listen to more realized versions of it. So you listen to a person who's got it. You go to, when you go to a guru or a teacher, because that person, just being in the presence of that person, allows you to entrain to the state of that person. You hang out with people on the street, you'll become like them. Like becomes like. We become what we behold, as William Blake put it. So we put in front of us something that embodies the opportunity to discover a more refined version of reality. But we don't look at it like an object. We look at it as an opportunity to resonate with it and see what happens when I, and I need to relax to do that, not make myself nervous about what I'm not or be criticizing myself because I'm not it. I need to entrain to it. I need to relax and it, if I can't become it that way, it's not worth becoming.